Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. This is Wendy Richards with Seaward Equipment. Welcome to the membrane-based solution for CSO SSO treatment. Um, I just wanted to cover a few housekeeping items before we begin. During the presentation, there will be five multiple choice questions to answer by poll. You will click on the answer you think is correct, hit the submit button, we'll post the results and move on. In order to receive your operator or PE credits for the webinar, you must complete the poll questions in the presentation. If you have any issues with the poll, take it out of poll screen. In addition, um, feel free to type in any questions that you have anytime at the questions drop down arrow and we'll do our best at the end of the presentation to answer them as time allows. Um, in order to receive your credits for this webinar, you must also complete a survey evaluation that will show up at the end. So please stay connected and try to complete that evaluation. Um, there is a, a certificate of completion attached in the handout section of the dashboard and you must um, also download this. In addition, there's a PDF of the whole presentation under the handouts. That pretty much wraps up the announcements. I'd like to introduce two uh, presenters, Ashwini Kare, who's product manager with Ovivo, and Mike Snodgrass, who's the membrane technology leader and the uh, technical leader for the CSO pilot unit in Seattle. And with that, Ashwini, you can take over. Thank you, Wendy. Good afternoon, everyone. Appreciate your time attending this webinar. Um, our presentation today provides an alternative approach to CSO, SSO treatment using silicon carbide ultrafiltration membranes. So a quick overview on what is CSO and SSO. The darker blue line here represents the combined sewer overflow or CSO. It conveys both the sewage and stormwater through a single pipe system and it directly discharges the combined flow excess of the wastewater treatment plant here uh, into the surface waters. And what is SSO? So the gray pipe here represents um, it's uh, the SSO, uh, the sanitary sewer um, um, overflow. It is meant to collect and convey the sanitary wastewater to this wastewater treatment plant. However, during heavy rainfall, uh, due to I and I, the, the infiltration and inflows, the flows in this pipeline can exceed the peak capacity of the wastewater treatment plant and may have to be discharged directly into the surface waters. So both of these CSO and SSO have a, a sewage component to it. So the challenge is uh, uh, many, this, many of the CSO discharges are into environmentally sensitive areas. They make the waterways and the surface water unsafe for recreational use. They can be an eyesore and they make news. So the scope of uh, uh, this issue is kind of outlined in the next two slides. Uh, annually, about 850 billion gallons of CSO is discharged into the wastewaters through more than 9,000 outfalls. So EPA established a CSO control policy in 1994, um, and there were uh, more than 800 permits out there and 38 consent decrees with the nine minimum controls and the long-term control plans out there. Um, if you look at the sanitary sewer overflows, there are more than 15,000 wastewater treatment plants and uh, more than 4,000 satellite uh, sanitary sewer systems with an annual overflow discharge of 10 billion gallons into the waterways. So this presents um, uh, the CSO and SSO treatment it, it is, can be a big challenge because of the variability of flows, loads, and bacterial composition. 
um, the first flush can uh, include so much more TSS, so much more solids and all kind of uh, and pathogens and all kind of runoff uh, um, into, the, um, into the streams, into the CSO and SSO. So it presents a, a challenge for treatment of um, uh, the varied loads and flows and uh, constantly adjust to the influent changes. Uh, this can present a bigger challenge for disinfection uh, to understand how much to uh, um, how much to dose, how much chlorine to dose, and because um, there are uh, TRC limits as well in the end for the uh, for the overflow. Um, pathogen removal is required from this raw sewage that is disposed disposed into the um, uh, waterways. Um, the storms can be extended for extended periods of time. They, there can be back-to-back -back storms. So the treatment system or the control system has to constantly adjust to the challenges of, uh, of this technology that uh, is needed. Instant permit compliance is needed. And in many cases, um, these overflows are in a very urban area by waterways or they are by, um, you know, in a small downtown area, so small footprints may be needed. Many of these uh, facilities could be unassisted, unmanned, uh, which could present problems if, um, you know, a lot of maintenance is needed during, or attention is needed during the, uh, the treatment process. So this is just a scope of challenges presented in control or treatment of CSO and SSO. Um, there are several approaches uh, to address the CSO and SSO issues. Uh, there are many ways this can be handled. There is no one size fits all solution. So we have a potential of um, you know, using inline or offline storage deep tunnels or inline storage within the sewer system, or green technologies, and many of these are typically used for uh, CSO control. Uh, for SSO control, many times the sewer uh, could be rehabs, the plants could be modified. Um, there, there is an option of passive treatment using um, treatment wetlands, vegetated swales, tree shrubs, this can be utilized for the CSO control, or um, there can be a supplemental high rate treatment, which are new structures, new equipment, uh, meant to address or, um, con or treat the excess flow over and above the wastewater treatment plant capacity. So there could be different types, chemical treatment, settling, filtration, flotation, so uh, many different approaches to uh, CSO and SSO controls, and many times there could be one or there could be combination of some or all of the above based on the holistic uh, analysis of, uh, for that uh, municipality. So today's uh, presentation, uh, we are, uh, the technology that we are presenting falls under the supplemental high rate treatment uh, area. So the membrane-based solution is, um, would be a, you know, a equipment that would be located um, to handle the excess flow uh, over and above the wastewater treatment facility. So there are many types within this. There could be fil filtration unit processes used or chemical treatment, settling or flotation and different types of available technology available in the market are listed here. So we are gonna talk about uh, uh, the membrane filtration today. So the poll question. Yes, um, so I'll launch the first poll question. Which category of CSO control options does membrane-based treatment fall under? Please select one, and don't forget to hit submit at the bottom. Uh, 
I'll give you a few more seconds to finish your voting. Okay, it looks like the majority of you have voted. I'm going to close and share the answers. Um, looks like the correct answer is number C, supplemental high rate treatment. Um, some of you picked all of the above. So if you have questions later, maybe we can cover that. We'll go on to the presentations. Okay. So where would this supplemental system apply for CSO? Um, this membrane-based solution uh, would, for CSO, would be at, at, at the outfall. It would be located here. And uh, the, the CSO will be treated and uh, the treated effluent would be discharged into the waterways right here. If you look at the SSO, um, this would be a standalone side stream treatment parallel to existing biological processes. And it, it would take it, you know, when the peaks exceed a certain limit of uh, the limit above the design of the wastewater treatment plant, it can be uh, sent to this standalone unit and it would treat uh, the influent and the two effluents from the wastewater treatment plant and the um, standalone unit can either be combined or um, they can be discharged separately after disinfection into the waterways. With that, I'm gonna hand over to Mike uh, to give like Membrane 101 and explain the key terms. Mike? Thank you, Ashwini. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for, for joining us. Um, just wanna give a little bit of a background on uh, membranes, uh, particularly in use in, in wastewater treatment. And uh, I'm sure everybody's heard of membranes, but not, not everybody's probably had uh, direct experience with them. Uh, just to start with a couple of key terms um, that I'll probably use during the presentation. Uh, first and foremost is, is flux. Um, flux is defined as the gallons of water treated per square foot of uh, membrane surface area. Uh, basically, it's, it's uh, a way to describe the efficiency of, of the membrane and, and uh, in terms of uh, its hydraulic throughput. Uh, next, uh, TMP or transmembrane pressure, that's just a, an indicator of, of the net dry pressure uh, required to uh, push or pull water through the membranes. Permeate, that's the treated effluent that's generated by the membranes. Um, backwash, which is uh, simply the reversal permeate through the membrane for, for cleaning purposes. And uh, last but not least, probably one of the, the key terms we'll talk about is air scouring. And uh, we're essentially probably an air up through the membrane um, to, to scour the surface and, and help keep the, the membrane clean. So what's unique about uh, membrane-based uh, treatment uh, solutions for, for CSO and, and SSO? Um, first, our membrane is, is a, what's considered an ultrafiltration membrane. Uh, but what's really key and paramount is that uh, membranes are a physical barrier layer. Um, and what that means is that um, basically if, if you have uh, some type of material that's larger than the membrane pores, it, it can't pass through. So really your effluent quality, the permit quality is, is independent of the influent quality. Uh, and why that's significant is it really, obviously you have a high level of insurance that you're gonna um, have uh, the same effluent quality time in and time out. Uh, but uh, it also allows uh, quite a bit of a turn down flexibility in, in any plant. So you're, you're not, uh, the, the quality you get out of the membrane is not really, is not in, it dependent on your hydraulic throughput. So it gives a lot of, lot, quite a lot of flexibility um, from an operation point of view. And then uh, uh, the pore size of the membranes, they're, they're smaller than bacteria, smaller than crypto, giardia, suspended solids. So you really do get a high, a very high effluent quality. And that's simply because the pores are so small and you can't um, have all this other stuff pass through. Uh, just to give you a little bit more detailed sense of the membrane filtration spectrum and, and where we lie um, uh, and also compared to, to other filtration mediums. So our, our membrane has a pore size of 0.1 microns or 0.1, uh, um, or I should say, uh, micrometers. 
um, that falls in the ultra filtration spectrum. And as you can see, the, that pore size correlates to pretty, pretty small pore size. So all the, as I mentioned before, your solids, bacteria, parasites, all that type of stuff is, is just simply too large to pass through. So you get a very, very high upfront quality coming out of the membrane. And just a simple overview on, on how our membranes work. Um, you know, there's a lot of membranes out there where um, you're pushing water through, but in our case, we're, we're pulling membranes, uh, pulling water through the, the membrane. So we're just applying a, a light vacuum to the clean side or permeate side of the membranes, and that is actually pulling water through. Um, the reason why we use vacuum pressure instead of positive pressure is it really helps improve the, the filtration efficiency. You, know, you don't have as much uh, pressure losses, so you get overall better performance through, through the membrane, uh, particularly in, in high solids or wastewater type uh, applications. Uh, solids and bacteria that are in the water, along with uh, any other particulate matter, they're retained at the membrane surface. Um, our air scouring process, which uh, runs continuously, uh, helps flush solids away from the membrane surface, scours it clean, and helps maintain a clean surface. Um, periodically, on a time basis, the membranes are backwashed, obviously, to remove solids and, and help keep the membrane clean during operation. Um, and then uh, periodically, uh, the membranes are chemically cleaned. Um, usually the, the most common cleaners are bleach or some type of uh, acids, uh, but periodically the membranes are chemically cleaned to, to fully restore membrane permeability. And in this uh, type of situation with uh, wet weather treatment, uh, the chemical cleaning is performed at the end of a storm event. Thank you, Mike. Um... So polymeric membranes were, have been widely used in drinking water and wastewater applications. However, uh, polymeric membranes by the nature of their chemistry cannot be left to dry after use. They need to stay wet and they can potentially get permanently damaged. So, but uh, CSO and SSO are seasonal and uh, they have intermittent flows coming in that requires the, uh, the, the system to stay offline for a long time and come online instantly. So for these reasons, uh, polymeric membranes couldn't be used for this application. So with silicon carbide membranes that we are using in this application, the chemistry is different and no treatment is needed um, before drying them off. They can be washed off easily and clean and left to dry without losing their permeability. So that allows us to uh, um, go with uh, the uh, silicon carbide membranes in this application. So this treatment system, rapid storm treatment system for CSO and SSO um, includes a few components that I'm gonna go over. It would have uh, CSO screens up front that would continuously clean uh, the screen as automatically as, as the influent comes in. Then there is a SIC or silicon carbide filtration system, membrane filtration system. Then there is a tank flushing system and the tank cleaning system after the storm. And then there is a control system that allows this treatment system to be completely automated. So how does it work? Um, during the storm, uh, the untreated CSO and SSO would pass through automatic self-cleaning screens. Then coagulant would be added and rapidly mixed into the influent. And the, the, the influent here mixed with the coagulant would get into the membrane basin. The, it would be filtered through the ultra filtration membranes by the suction created by the permeate pump. And like Mike mentions, the mem mentioned the membranes would present a physical barrier for any solids greater than uh, 0.1 microns that involves bacteria, some viruses, and a lot of pathogens. So that would be rejected in the tank and only clean water would pass through into the permeate pump. There would be air scour uh, going on to keep the membranes clean during operation. 
and we would be measuring the total suspended solids in the tank and continuously measuring turbidity of the clean water. Um, next poll. Sure. Okay. I'm going to launch the next question. Hold on a second. How do membranes remove solids? Please select one. I think the voting is happening a lot faster on this one. It looks like the majority of you have voted. I'll give you another second or two. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and share the answers. So the correct answer is B, provides a physical filtration barrier with a small pore size. Um, it looks like the majority of you did select that answer, so that's very good. And we'll move on. Okay. So how does it work? Um, we have a little video to share, and uh, these are this demonstrates how the screens, which are six millimeter by six millimeter mesh, would uh, the, the storm water would enter at the bottom of the tank and flow upwards through the bottom of the screens. The solids are rejected in the back tank there and only screened influent would come into the uh, mixing zone with the coagulum. So here's the, the video of the automatic brushes would, would be cleaning the screen from uh, top and the bottom continuously during um, the storm whenever the storm comes in and when the unit is online. So after the storm, um, how does it work? So the membranes will be spray cleaned with water and the tank will be the self-regulating um, CWF, which is the controlled water flusher shown here, which is a tank cleaning mechanism. So this holds the storm water and it would clean uh, the, the floor of the tank after the storm, the rejected solids from uh, the membrane and from the tank cleaning would be sent to wastewater treatment plant or wherever it has to go for solid processing after the storm. And then after the tank is completely drained and clear, um, membrane clean in place will be performed. Um, the permeate pump um, could be a reversible backwash pump or there could be a separate backwash pump to do that. And it would utilize uh, chemicals that Mike mentioned for cleaning the membranes and get ready for the next storm. Wendy. Okay, time for another poll question. Which of the following are not the components of a membrane-based treatment solution? The control system, screen, tank flushing system, membranes, large storage equalization tank. I'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, we'll close the vote. And the correct answer is E, the, the large storage and equalization tank are not considered part of this. <clears throat> I know they showed up. I guess what we're looking at is what's included in the scope of the actual supplied equipment. And with that, we'll move on. Okay, so silicon carbide membrane is a very robust membrane 
and it allows for you know if it, uh, for cleaning it allows for pressure cleaning if needed so there's a short video that demonstrates how it can be cleaned um, with pressurized water this demonstrates how robust the membrane is and uh, in hardness it is be it it is one level lower than uh, diamond. So a really tough material, very easy to clean after the storm. As you can see, it, can, it is sparking clean with the spray wash. So how are the solids removed from the tank? So when the storm comes in into the membrane tank, if the storm water comes in into the membrane tank, it all fills up the tank slowly. And while it fills the tank, it also fills the uh, bell of this controlled water flusher and venting via this one-way valve at the top above the tank. And during the storm, it fills the bell and the pipe. And after the storm ends, uh, the water starts draining. The CWF still holds the water column via a closed vacuum break. And then as, as it drains through the sump here, the vacuum releases and gushing the, the stored storm water straight um, out of the bell. And in the process, um, the tank floor is flushed clean um, using the roughing, fine and polishing flushing reg regime and uh, the system is ready for the next event. Uh, this, um, as you can see, this is all self-regulating. There is no power usage here. And the water used for cleaning the tank is the stored storm water. This is not any uh, additional potable water required for cleaning the tank. Here's a demonstration of how the water is cleaned. So that demonstrates how the uh, tank floor can be cleaned effectively with the gush and with, with using the storm water stored in the bell. This is a picture of before flushing and this is a picture of after flushing. So the effluent quality, um, uh, this is very important to know. Um, the typical CSO permits are outlined here, which are uh, usually log removal of two, fecal of less than 200%, uh, percent, uh, TSS reduction of 50%. So, and you can see in the um, following slides that Mike will present on uh, this, uh, the Seattle pilot that we had, um, the achievable effluent quality through the rapid storm system is much higher than a typical CSO permit limit. We can get to down to six log removal, uh, almost non-detect of fecal coliform, BOD reduction of less than 85%. Um, in, you know, it, in many cases, it can um, meet the secondary effluent uh, uh, quality based on, um, you know, it really depends on how much soluble BOD uh, is included in the influent, but it can, on the most part, meet uh, the secondary treatment limits. Because we are, uh, the membranes are presenting as a, as a physical barrier for solid removal, the solid removal can be gar guaranteed to be less than five milligram per liter, which is equivalent to 99.5% TSS reduction and a really low turbidity limit. So what is the benefit of this higher effluent quality, higher than needed effluent quality? This actually can reduce the disinfection requirements substantially. 
because of the pathogen removal, because of um, the TSS removal. And it, it would also assure that the permit won't be violated, even if the disinfection falls short or if there is a sudden high load of, uh, or the first flush, which contains more pathogens than normal. And uh, so there is a definite advantage um, with disinfection for that. Here's a conceptual layout of a 20 MGD plant, um, how the plant would look like. So this could be below grade. This one shown here is completely below grade and uh, it, it could be built above grade as well. The plant shown here is 100 feet by 86 feet dimension and it can handle 20 million gallons a day for 24 hours nonstop. It can also handle greater than uh, uh, two Q peaks above uh, 20 MTD, um, depending on the influent quality. Um, it, it really depends on uh, what kind of uh, uh, TSS is coming in, but it can potentially match the hydrograph. And in, in this kind of uh, uh, application, the flows keep uh, fluctuating. Um, and the membranes can uh, address that uh, a certain certain flux for a certain duration. So it can be ramped up for a shorter duration. And that way, higher peaks can be met with uh, a membrane-based design. And as you can see, the these are the membranes. This is a membrane tank. I'll, I'll run you through it. Um, the two boxes here are where the screens would be located. The screen is below grade. From there, it would go to the rapid mix basin, one on each side. And from there, it would get into the membrane tanks. The membrane tanks have a, a tank cleaning device there and which releases the solids into the sump here. And these are the permeate pumps for creating suction to pull the per clean water out of the membranes. This area is to store some amount of uh, clean water and the same clean water can be used for backwashing uh, the membranes. And this area is reserved for blowers and control panel and um, any chem chemicals that are needed for membrane cleaning but there is no EQ or any kind of storage needed, no large uh, disinfection storage is needed. So uh, this is the full footprint here as shown in the conceptual layout. With that, I'll let Mike uh, talk about the pilot testing at Seattle. Uh, thank you, Ashwin. So yeah, I want to talk a little bit about our uh, pilot test up in uh, uh, Seattle for, for King County. Uh, unfortunately, our, our testing is on hold for, for obvious reasons. We had to suspend testing back in uh, March, so hopefully we'll be able to uh, resume and, and complete our, our, uh, our study up there. Um, just a little bit of background first on, on, on the pilot. The original intention was to pilot test at an actual CSO facility um, within, the, within their uh, conveyance system. Um, but just due to the logistical challenges of integrating a pilot into their CSO facility, uh, which just proved to be problematic. And so a decision was made to, to move the pilot to an actual um, wastewater treatment plant. Um, it's a uh, 80 MGD average uh, daily flow wastewater treatment plant. And uh, we've been operating um, on their primary uh, clarified effluent. So not uh, obviously not a CSO site, but uh, more of a uh, SSO application. Um, but for the um, intents and purposes of, of the pilot, we've got, uh, I would say, a very accurate uh, feed water quality in terms of what we're trying to, to, to treat. So um, that's what, the, what we've been uh, focusing on and testing on with our, with our pilot study at Bikini County. Um, before we even got to, to the stage of piloting up at King County, we had to do a demonstration test to, to basically show, okay, can this technology actually achieve the treatment goals and can it uh, do so in the manner in which uh, storm treatment would be needed? Uh, and by that, I mean, can you uh, have it in a dry state, bring it online very quickly, and how quickly do you, do you uh, see treatment? 
Um, so we did a demonstration test at a, a site in Texas. Um, this was under dry weather conditions, so we were treating uh, raw input under uh, basically full strength uh, uh, um, concentrations of uh, pathogens, TSS, all, all that type of stuff. So you could say it was, uh, in a sense, a worst case scenario. Um, but anyway, we, we did a, a very brief demonstration study to look at the um, achievable treatment capabilities. And the data here uh, is just a summary of some of the, um, the measurements we took and the levels of treatment that we were able to, to achieve. Uh, as uh, as Winnie mentioned already, um, very high TSS removal. Um, you know, we were well above 99.5% uh, on an average basis. Uh, we saw very good BOD removal. Uh, as you can see in the data here, we the effluent levels were pretty much the, the same. Um, and that's probably just a, just a, a reflection of, of the soluble BOD that's uh, obviously going to pass through uh, through the membrane. On the, the fecal coliform side, um, obviously very, very good uh, effluent uh, levels on that. So very high uh, log removal rates, um, average about 6.4 log, uh, log reduction. Um, we, we wanted to, to try and take a look at uh, some heavy metals removal. So we actually were, were spiking the influent with a, a copper sulfate uh, solution, uh, just to get a sense of, of what type of heavy metal removal rates we would uh, see with the, with the system, because that's certainly, while it's not a permit requirement, it's certainly an area, uh, an issue of concern up in, uh, up in the Pacific Northwest. And then uh, we also took a look at uh, phosphorus removal. Um, because uh, there's certainly some areas where, where nutrient discharge is, is uh, um, you know, is a concern, and, and if you're able to see that with uh, your storm treatment, then that's obviously an, an, an added benefit. So, as you can see, with all these constituents that we looked at, we saw excellent, excellent treatment capabilities, and removal capabilities with the with the membrane. Okay, <clears throat> I'll launch uh, poll question number four. What is the average log removal achievable by membranes? Please select one. Six, four, two, none, or five? Give you a couple more seconds. Okay, we'll close the uh, the poll launch. The correct answer is A, six log removal by these membranes. And it looks like the majority of you did get that right, 55%. That's good. And we'll move on. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Wendy. So just to, um, you know, as we, we've talked about uh, a key part of, of uh, why we're here today is, is to, to discuss the ability to, to provide uh, rapid treatment, um, be able to, to meet our treatment goals very quickly with an onset of the storm. Our pilot testing in Seattle is, is, has been divided into two phases. One is uh, what we're calling preliminary testing, where we're basically trying to understand how the technology behaves on their wastewater, understand flux rates, cleaning uh, requirements, as well as uh, uh, some treatment uh, performance goals. And, uh, and then the second phase will be a, a formal uh, process evaluation. So in the preliminary testing, we haven't been doing uh, a lot of um, uh, call form sampling, and that's simply just to alleviate the burden of, of their test lab. Um, but King County people are very familiar with, with membranes and they are uh, perfectly happy using turbidity as a uh, indicator for uh, pathogen removal. Um, and, uh, and typically with membranes, it's, you know, the goal is to be below uh, 0.2 effluent into you. Um, when you have that, that's a good indication that you, you are achieving you know, six log removal or higher um, with regards to, to, to coliform. So this data right here is, is during an actual storm event. Um, and as you can see, 
uh, we were able to achieve very low effluent turbidity very quickly. Um, our, our first samples, they're, they're you know, a little bit above 0.2 NTU, but that's simply just the residual error in the system. And as you can see, we, we bring, a, bring the effluent quality or effluent turbidity down to extremely low levels very quickly, and we're able to sustain that throughout, uh, um, throughout the, the, opera, the, the test um, during this, the storm event. Um, average turbidity during this time was 0.016 NTU, which is extremely, extremely low. So that's a good indication that all TSS and call form have, have been uh, removed. Uh, our, our pilot capacity for um, for the Seattle pilot is, is it's a 300,000 gallons per day. Um, this is our, our effluent flow that we have, the system generated during the storm. So we are able to, to maintain um, design capacity over a 48 hour event. Um, this was sort of a unique uh, uh, situation in, in Seattle where they've had a prolonged rain event after rain event. And uh, we were able to, to uh, sustain operation over the entire time. Their typical storm event is probably uh, on the high side is probably 20 hours long. <clears throat> So a 48 hour uh, storm event uh, where they were seeing uh, high flows uh, was, was unusual, but nonetheless, um, the, the pilot was able to sustain operation during that entire time. And as you can see, the, the TSS is certainly varying throughout the, throughout the storm. Obviously, recovery is, is critical for, for a membrane-based uh, wet weather treatment system. And this is some data to show um, our recovery capabilities. If you look at the, the blue bars, that represents um, our transmembrane pressure at the end of a, of a pilot run or a test run. Uh, obviously, the higher the, the TMP uh, or the higher the, the blue bar is, the more plugged the membranes are. And the orange bars represent uh, the, the transmembrane pressure after our chemical cleaning process. And then obviously the gaps in between represents when the, the system was stored dry. Um, the dash green line is our, is our baseline uh, pressure, our net dry pressure requirement. Um, so as you can see with each run and each clean, we're able to, to achieve full recovery uh, each and every time. So uh, it just goes to show that, uh, that the membrane-based uh, treatment approach can be reliable in terms of of ensuring complete recovery after a storm event, and uh, as well as ensuring that it's ready for the next one. Uh, earlier in the presentation, when I was talking about you know the the, the impact that uh, a physical barrier layer uh, like a membrane provides, uh, one of the benefits is, is the turndown ratio, um, and this, this is some data to to show just uh, uh, to, to try and demonstrate that that capability. So this is. Um, the actual CSO sites at, uh, at King County, obviously they can have flows over quite a huge range, uh, you know, roughly a 10 to one uh, turn down ratio. Um, and obviously they're, they're at uh, very different uh, durations, but with the, the membrane's ability to operate and, and generate um, the same f one quality regardless of flow, it does give us quite a bit of uh, uh, flexibility in terms of the turn down ratio and how the how the system can be designed. So, so really, when it comes down to the ability to uh, turn the system down for, for lower flows, um, the, the rate limiting uh, factor actually becomes your your rotated equipment like pumps. So, but uh, nonetheless, the membranes have quite a bit of flexibility to operate over an extreme uh, range of flows during uh, during a particular storm event. So moving on to uh, the next pilot. So we would be having a, a pilot testing um, activity at Alley Creek CSO in New York. So Alley Creek is a, a pristine creek, um, which is used heavily for water recreational activities. There is also a private beach located one mile downstream, downstream of the uh, main outfall into Alley Creek. So for that, and the, if the interococci level at uh, the discharge exceeds 35, that triggers the beach closing. So for that reason, they are looking at um, alternatives. Um, and the plan is to pilot this uh, for the next uh, few months and 
an evaluation will be presented to NYDEC to see if this is a viable technology to meet the effluent goals they have and uh, if this is a technology that uses limited chemicals. So the goals of this pilot at Alley Creek, New York would be um, to demonstrate uh, the effluent quality, which is fecal less than 200, enterococci less than 30. Um, we have to demonstrate rapid treatment, instant comp compliance. Um, we will demonstrate sustainable operation over the design flows for 24 hours. We will be um, also demonstrating full recoverability and an easy cleanup after, after the storm. A uh, first flush event will also be simulated and uh, the, the uh, pilot will be tested for all these conditions. This is a, a trailer mounted demo unit uh, demonstration of technology and the testing period should start sometime in August uh, 2020. So it, it's potentially going to be shipped uh, end of July. So uh, as a summary, uh, this is um, technology comparison between um, different type of controls options. And uh, here we have compared uh, chlor dechlor with uh, deep tunnel, with peak, extreme peak flow treatment, um, ballasted clarification, and in the end is the membrane-based system. So as you can see, the membrane-based system, uh, the plus uh, means good performance, uh, the zero means satisfactory performance, or the O means satisfactory performance and the negative is poor performance. So um, all these uh, parameters are listed on the left. So the, the OVIVO uh, system, the membrane-based system can provide rapid treatment, handle versatility, uh, has versatility to handle flow and load variation um, with automa automatic operation. It, it is uh, good for unassisted, unassisted operation. Footprints low, no chlorine residual, low chlorine residual, uh, very good disinfection, uh, reduced disinfection requirement, effluent pH is not an issue, BOD removal of 84.5% average, TSS removal of 99.5% average, and lower chemical cost and satisfactory performance with the overall cost. Okay, um, very good. I'm going to launch the last question. Which of the following are the reasons to use membrane-based uh, treatment solution for CSO? Please select one. Give you another couple seconds. This looks like an easy one. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and share the results. Looks like 100% of you did get that right. All of the above. Good job. And we'll move on. Unless... Thank you, Wendy. This is just sure. a slide, uh, some take home, take home points from this presentation. So basically the membrane-based treatment there, uh, provides another tool in the toolkit for CSO, SSO treatment. Um, there are many options out there. This is just one other option um, to see if it fits in, in the needs. It provides high quality effluent in two minutes, uh, six log pathogen removal, very small footprint, no storage needed, um, and it is automated operation. With that, we'd like to thank you all for attending the presentation. Uh, yes, thanks, uh, Ashwini and Mike. Um, I think due to the uh, really good performance and ease of operation and even retrofit into existing uh, tanks, this could be a really good tool in the toolbox for CSO and SSO treatment. Um, just a reminder to download the certificate of completion and also the PDF of the whole presentation before we close it. Um, I'll now read a few questions 
as we have time for. And the rest can be answered uh, via email if we don't get to your questions. As a reminder, if you do have questions, just type them into the question box. And with that, I'll see if we can read a few. Okay, hold on, there's quite a few. <laughs> This, uh, what is the brown tank in the slide number 20? I think we described that pretty well. What are the cost requirements of the system compared to other similar systems on the market? So is that question directed to the uh, cost of the system or cost of um, other things beyond the system? I, I believe it's probably directed as the cost for this solution compared to other solutions. Okay, so um, it it should be uh, the comparable uh, treatment um, technologies would be, um, you would say the um, cloth media filters or the clarif uh, ballasted clarifications and uh, compressed media filters. But these are, uh, uh, they may not be able to meet the effluent uh, quality that uh, a membrane-based system would be able to meet. So it, it's really a hard question because we are not uh, comparing, um, uh, it's like comparing apples and oranges. The quality is very different with membranes. So the it, it, just the cost of the system may not be have to be compared. It has to be compared with uh, the disinfection requirements downstream, the flocculation requirements, the rapid mix and all of that. It has to be a very comprehensive comparison. Right. Thank you, Ashwini. I think too, if it could be retrofit into an existing uh, storage tank or CSO treatment facility that might be a game changer in terms of cost if some of the infrastructure already exists. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. Uh, we can absolutely use existing tanks, storage tanks, and um, uh, pile up the modules of membranes in a really small footprint. And, and that can totally be a game changer in terms of uh, the total installed cost. So another question asked is, can this be used in place of disinfection of a wastewater treatment plant effluent? Um, this is probably a question for the regulators. Um, we can provide the uh, quality that we get uh, with, uh, with our system. And you have seen that there is a six log removal, but it's, it's um, and, and a total fecal coliform removal um, all of that we have demonstrated that we can meet that kind of effluent quality, but this comes back to what regulators would allow, uh, whether it can be used in place of disinfection or not. Okay, good. Another question similar, can this system be a part of a wastewater plant process? I know you showed it as a parallel mm -hmm. uh, blending process for SSO. I guess the question is, can it be used as a part of the treatment plant process. Yes, so um, yeah, it, it can be used, like you said, Wendy, um, uh, to handle SSOs. Um, it would be a system that would be offline most of the time um, at, at, the, at the wastewater treatment facility, but it's a standalone treatment system. And it would come online only when the peaks are exceeded beyond the capacity of the wastewater treatment plant. And uh, so the rest of the year, it would be offline. This really allows uh, um, also the waste from this standalone facility, the standalone unit can go to the, um, uh, uh, to the existing wastewater treatment plant. And that can actually help the F to M ratio in the biological system of the existing wastewater treatment plant. So this can be a really good addition that handles, not only handles the peak flows uh, whenever they come in, and also provides uh, food for, um, for the standard, the existing wastewater treatment plant, which is uh, really getting dilute influent during uh, storm flows. 
Yeah, that's a really good point. We do see a lot of dilution during wet weather events um, and a lot of plants that don't have enough food to mass ratio. Another question, what is the life expectancy and replacement frequency of the membranes when in use? I know they sit idle for a long time, but when they are used, what is the expected life expectancy? Mike, you want to take that? Sure. Yeah, I mean, the, we're anticipating, uh, you know, at least probably, you know, two times the, the membrane life compared to uh, typical polymeric membranes. Uh, you know, a big difference about this technology is that the, you don't have the, the chemical degradation that other membranes do over time um, due to bleach cleaning as well as, as material fatigue. So, you know, the, the, the life of the membrane, I mean, the material is essentially a, a rock and, and uh, it, it's going to last an extremely long time. Um, you know, there are lots of uh, ceramic sy systems, uh, particularly in Asia, that are well past their 20-year their mark uh, in, terms of, in terms of membrane life. So, uh, in this application, um, you know, the intermittent use should, should make the, the membrane life even longer um, because it's, it's less abuse that the membrane will see over its life. And, uh, um, and, and like I said, it's, it's, an, it's chemically inert, so it's not going to have that same uh, degradation due to repeated uh, chemical cleanings over time. Very good. I think that pretty much wraps it up. I don't have any other questions uh, pertaining to the technology. Um, I just wanted to remind you after the webinar is closed to please complete the survey that will show up so that you get credits for this. And I thank everyone for their time today and hope you have a great 4th of July weekend. Thank you so much, Wendy. If there's thank any questions, you. feel free to email myself or um, if you do have the email addresses for the Ovigo folks, feel free to email them directly as well. Thank you.